essentially taking up some of this IRS-1 substrate and phosphorylating phosphorylating it. Oh, wow. I can't speak anymore. That's what happens when I have too much caffeine. Phosphorylating it at a different amino acid residue, which in a way um, is responsible for causing some insulin resistance of the liver. So some people look at that and they think, well, you know, okay, it's kind of bad because the, the liver can't process the glucose anymore. Uh, but it also can't activate de novo lipogenesis anymore. So I guess there's a, a good aspect of this. But there isn't, because if you over-consume fructose, it turns out that it will turn on an, uh, something called CHREBP, that's carbohydrate response element binding protein, uh, and this activates all of these lipogenesis enzymes, and it also increases SREBP1, which also turns on glucokinase. So all of this, is essentially your liver is now primed to soak up the carbohydrate and turn it into fat. You know, it's just primed to do that. And here's, here's a, uh, a reference in case you're interested. Replacing dietary glucose with fructose increases CHREBP activity and CREBP1 protein. So what's going on? So in normal individuals, as we discussed, the binding of insulin to its receptor on the liver cell inhibits glucose production. So if you eat carbohydrate or you eat protein, there's insulin that's secreted, that binds to the liver, the liver's gonna stop producing glucose. It's gonna stop releasing glucose in the bloodstream because it knows that there's enough. But, uh, and of course, this process is to maintain normal glucose uh, blood levels. But once the liver is insulin resistant, it goes into a constant state of gluconeogenesis. It's like it, it doesn't care if there's enough glucose in the bloodstream. It's going to keep pumping out more. Now, you can imagine that's a bad thing. The reason why the body goes out of its way to control glucose is because in excess, it becomes toxic. It, it has really bad... Uh, effects on various proteins and it can glycate them so that the glue like I said uh, there's uh, carbohydrate residues that are tagged on to various proteins when glucose levels are really high the glucose can just get tagged down without the action of any enzyme and that really messes things up messes up communication messes up protein folding it can cause cross-linking this is really bad and we're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, so this gluconeogenesis uh, stuff gets turned on regardless of blood glucose levels, and the resulting high levels of blood glucose as well as inter insulin, as well as triglycerides from the de novo lipogenesis, that's gonna stimulate the, the adipocytes to, stir to, to store more fat, right? As well as the muscle cells to store more glycogen. But then at some point, they're gonna get saturated. But the muscle cells and the fat cells are gonna say, hey, we've had enough, we've got enough glucose. So what happens then? Well, this, remember this GLUT4 that was allowing the glucose to enter the cells is actually going to get retracted. You know, this is like a cannon. You've got your, your castle and you can like stick the cannon through the hole in the wall and then, you know, shoot at your enemies. Well, it, you can get retracted too and it doesn't do its job anymore. So the cells are just like, hey, I'm going to deactivate this because it's just, I've got enough. So now you're dealing with muscle cells and fat cells that are insulin resistant. Even though insulin is binding to the receptor, this is not being activated anymore. Because you're like, hey, man, we, we have enough. They're like, there's too much glucose. This is essentially the cells trying to protect themselves, right? So in addition to that, there's something called RBP4, a fat rush factor that's increased. And this may be in combination with vitamin A, impairs the, the insulin signaling in muscle, and inhibits the glucose uptake, and interferes with insulin-mediated suppression of glucose production in the liver, causing blood glucose to rise even more. So this gets to uh, advanced glycation end products, and this is another acronym that's very appropriate because the acronym is AGES. And you know, if you, a lot of the proteins in your skin get glycated and cross-link, your skin is going to, uh, you're essentially going to look a lot older. You're gonna get wrinkles, and you're going to look a lot older faster. You know, oil of ole is not going to help you here. So it turns out that fructose is seven times more likely than glucose to form advanced glycation end products. 
As I uh, mentioned before, this is really bad because the body uses these saccharides as a communication system, and they can also cause like a misfolding of protein and a cross-linking of proteins, which is really problematic and inflammatory. One thing that can also get glycated, and the term glycated, remember, refers to the sugar getting attached to something, is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a heme protein, which means it has a, a porphyrin with an iron in the center. It transports oxygen th through the blood. Myoglobin is what's in the muscle cells. It does a very similar thing. If that gets glycated, you can detect it, and the test is called HbA1c, like glycated uh, hemoglobin, and this is essentially a way to determine like, how much sugar has been uh, in the bloodstream over, let's say, a span of uh, one, two, three months. Like, what, what has this person been, how has this person been eating and what has this person been doing? So here is the, a paper on long-term fructose consumption and glycation, again, to, su to, to support some of the claims I'm making here. And here's this whole glycated hemoglobin thing. And what I like about the glycated hemoglobin, if you read this paper, let's just take a look at the conclusion quickly, that in this community-based population of non-diabetic adults, glycated hemoglobin was similarly associated with risk of diabetes, but more strongly associated with risks of cardiovascular disease and death from any cause as compared with fasting glucose. These data add to the evidence supporting the use of glycated hemoglobin as a diagnostic test for diabetes. So this is a really, really important biomarker of health. And one of the things that you should look at, it's a cheap test, it's a cheap add-on, and one of the things that you probably want to look at as far as sugar management is concerned. So now we get into this glucose toxicity thing. So, you know, we've, we've got these high levels of glucose all the time because now muscle is insulin resistant, fat is insulin resistant, and maybe even the brain. And the liver is insulin resistant, constantly in gluconeogenesis, just dumping glucose in the bloodstream even though it doesn't need it, which means that insulin levels are high all the time. So the beta cells of the pancreas, which are the cells that produce the glucose, uh, the, the insulin, sorry, uh, are getting, are ha have a lot of work to do. And just like anybody, too much, too much work and they burn out. And you can imagine that's really bad because you then get to a scenario where you don't have enough insulin production relative to your level of insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance. And this has been analyzed as far as the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is concerned. So on, on the y-axis, we have our insulin sensitivity. And then on the x-axis, uh, sorry, this would be y. This would, it doesn't matter. Uh, this would be y. Uh, x, this would be y. And over here, we have like, how much insulin is being secreted as a response to glucose. So you see that if your insulin sensitivity is really good and you produce enough insulin, then really you're above the 50th percentile and your risk of getting diabetes isn't very high. But if your insulin sensitivity is crap and your insulin production is crap, then you know, you're, you're dealing with type 2 diabetes. There's another phenomenon, too, where people have... Uh, decent amount of insulin production for their given uh, level of insulin resistance. And these are folks that can suffer from hypoglycemia. So they're producing a little bit too much insulin, even though they're slightly insulin resistant, and eventually there's going to be a huge crash. All the sugar is going to get put away, but it just takes a little bit of time. And some of these folks think that that's not because they're eating too much sugar or that they don't have any me metabolic problems, but it is. It is a metabolic problem. You know, and it still has to do with insulin resistance. So the high level of glucose will result in high insulin and triglyceride as we talked about uh, production and levels in the bloodstream. This is going to trigger fast storage in the fat cells. Remember, right, the, the lipoprotein lipase, that, is, uh, that responds to insulin in the bloodstream. And this will first lead to fat accumulation around the waist, something that we call visceral fat and leads to the production of adipokines. There's good adipokines, there's bad adipokines. Leptin is an adipokine, for example. But these fat cells around your waist are producing adipokines. Some of them can wreak havoc on your metabolism. And adipokine, increased adipokine production is correlated with a lot of really nasty stuff. For example, increased endothelial dysfunction, increased monocyte inflammation and uh, inflammatory gene expression, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, skeletal muscle insulin resistance, cardiac insulin resistance, interstitial fibrosis, diastolic dysfunction, beta cell apoptosis, and Alzheimer's disease.
all of all of which you know are due to excess consumption of fructose and the uh, cascade that uh, that results. So what else can happen? You know, we're not done. <laughs> As if the, the list wasn't bad enough, eventually. All of this palmitoyl co uh, CoA is going to get packaged into triglycerides. It's going to get packaged into BLDL and shipped out. And then we have a situation where the liver is just cranking out too much VLDL. And there's a protein. It's called cholesterol ester transfer protein, uh, whose job it is to kind of switch things around, plays a little switcheroo game. Now, where there's not too much uh, VLDL, this is not a problem. But when there's a lot of VLDL, this causes a huge problem in that the transfer from triglycerides from the LDL, puts that into the HDL, takes some cholesterol from the HDL, puts that into the DLDL, which means that cholesterol, the HDL thinks it's done its job now, and that increases the renal clearance of HDL. So your HDL cholesterol or HDL lipoprotein is going down. On the other hand, this, uh, very similar things happen with LDL which results in small, dense lipoprotein. What is this? This is dyslipidemia, right? You go to your doc, you get, uh, you get your LDL and your HDL checked, and the doc says, yeah, your HDL is too low and your LDL is too high. And then you get a particle size done, and he's like, yeah, your LDL is all small and dense. You're on your way to heart disease. Why? Because of this. Is it because you're eating too much fat? No, because you're eating too much carbohydrate. Caloric sweetener consumption and dyslipidemia among U.S. adults. Again, some literature to support some of the claims that I'm making here. And this is just a summary of what we've talked about already. So what's bad about the small, dense LDL? Well, it persists longer in the bloodstream compared to the large, buoyant LDL, the pattern A. It adheres to components of atherosclerotic plaque and is more likely to gain entry into plaque. So uh, small, dense LDL is much more likely to cause plaque buildup in the arteries and clog arteries. It's more likely to be taken up by inflammatory white blood cells, which in turn become the mast cell that fill the coronary plaque. So if anybody knows the exact process of how plaque builds, essentially contributing more to that process. So they, the macrophages uh, get involved, that develops into the cap, and eventually that stuff can come out, uh, can uh, get unstuck from the uh, artery and clog something else downstream. Small dense LDL is more likely to be oxidized, again, uh, involved in atherosclerosis. And small dense a LDL is eight times more susceptible to glycation than large buoyant LDL. So the, the small dense LDL is really a problem. And then, of course, if you eat a whole lot of this stuff and the, the whole process continues, you're going to get lipid droplets uh, in your liver, and you are going to get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And they call it non-alcoholic because this used to be something that only alcoholics would get until they discovered that actually even people who don't drink get this stuff. And it's because just like alcohol, fructose is only metabolized by the liver. So here's fructose-induced fatty liver disease. Again, some literature to support the claims that we're making here. Some people will say, well, gee, you know, does it really matter what happens if I get you know, this non-alcoholic um, fatty liver disease, uh, this is again more literature to support that claim, well, the incidence and risk factors of hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, it increases your chances of getting liver cancer if you have uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if you're interested in some of the details on how that occurs, I would recommend reading this article, The Immune System is Implied There. We're not done. There's more stuff that happens with carbohydrate uh, excess ingestion of uh, fructose specifically. So every time, remember, there's this fructokinase and glucokinase that phosphorylates the sugar just to make sure that it stays in the cell. Every time that happens, there's inorganic phosphorus that's released, and there's one molecule of ADP that's made. That inorganic phosphorus activates something called AMP deaminase 1, and AMP gets transformed into IMP, which gets transformed into inosine. This inosine gets transformed into hypoxanthine, xanthine, and finally, uric acid. Is anybody familiar with uric acid? Yeah, what does it cause? Gout. Yeah, it causes gout. It's interesting. If you go to the doctor and you say you have gout, what is he going to tell you not to eat? Protein. Yeah. And it turns out that that's because some of the uric acid is a byproduct of purine metabolism.
And it is true that to a certain extent, protein metabolism will create purines as well as some uric acid. What the doc might not know is that protein consumption increases uric acid clearance by the kidneys, whereas excess fructose consumption does not. So excess fructose consumption will lead to increased uric acid buildup in the bloodstream. What's interesting is that this is not all that problematic. About 50% of the antioxidant capability of the blood comes from uric acid. It's an antioxidant. But if you saturate the blood with it and it starts to precipitate out, then it's highly inflammatory. And one of the effects is gout. The other effect is inhibition of an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase. And nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It dilates blood vessels. So you can imagine the, the blood vessels aren't getting dilated, blood pressure increases. And it is responsible for increased blood pressure, which is a risk for cardiovascular disease. And here's sugar-sweetened beverages, serum uric acid, and blood pressure in adolescents. Reducing consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages is associated with reduced blood pressure. Right? Okay? I'm not making this up. There's also an enzyme called aldosterone that gets into the mix, and aldosterone is going to increase sodium retention and increase blood pressure as well. And then we get into the reactive oxygen species. So carbohydrate metabolism, more so than fat metabolism, is going to create reactive oxygen species when it's metabolized by the mitochondria. Those reactive oxygen species, as we mentioned before, they're implicated in aging because they do damage to molecules, specifically DNA. Uh, and, but they can be quenched by various antioxidants. So this, um, you know, one of the questions you could ask is, like, well, gee, I wonder if it's a good idea to eat a lot of, uh, of sugar, a lot of refined carbohydrates that don't contain any vitamins don't contain any antioxidants. Yeah, it's a bad idea, right? Because you're, you're increasing your exposure to this oxidation process. So this is, this is the reason why fruit contains vitamins. You know, the, the people tell you, oh, you should eat fruits because they contain a lot of vitamins and antioxidants. Yeah, because they're needed. But interestingly enough, human beings have been selecting for increasingly sweeter and sweeter fruits, and we completely screwed up the, uh, the ratio of sugar relative to... to um, vitamins that should be in there, such that fruits don't contain enough vitamins. In fact, if you eat too much sugar, your vitamin stores are going to go down. Whereas if you eat vegetables that have a lot less sugar in them, but a lot more vitamins, you're going to be fine. There's someone uh, on, the, on the web that asked a question, is there a way as an endurance athlete to avoid this oxidative damage because endurance athletes probably need to fuel with about you know 60% carbohydrate. If they were doing really low intensity long distance, that wouldn't be necessary. But because it's high intensity, it's like you know, a marathon is six minute miles for, for hours, it becomes mostly carbohydrate fueled. And because it's carbohydrate fueled, it's making a lot of reactive oxygen species. I would say, well, your best bet, no, you can't avoid it but you can minimize it by eating real food. You know, stay away from the stupid goo stuff and all the other crap that they feed you and eat real food, and it will at least mitigate some of the damage. I think another question that we had was about glutamine and whether or not glutamine um, supplementation was, uh, was recommended. And you know, post-workout, you wanna throw in some glutamine in there. Your, that's a glucogenic amino acid, hence the name, your body can take that, turn it into glucose, and it's a really smart way to make your body work for what it needs. Instead of giving it the substrate directly, you can give it glutamine, which it has to you know, spend a little bit of energy to turn into glucose and then store. So yeah, I mean, there's no problem with glutamine uh, supplementation. What does become a problem, though, is for people who are not athletes, who are consuming a lot of this stuff and don't know about it, you know, MSG, is monosodium glutamate. So it's a monosodium salt of glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is also a glucogenic amino acid. And people who are eating this stuff all the time are essentially loading their bodies with a lot of an amino acid that can be turned into sugar. And guess what? It will be turned into sugar and it will make you fat. So the MSG stuff is not recommended. So a little bit more on the reactive oxygen species. If you look at the length of the amino acid, beta oxidation versus the Krebs cycle, you see that beta oxidation 
gives you a lot more FADH, and it turns out that this FADH produces a lot less because it's burned in a different complex of the mitochondria. It gives you a lot less reactive oxygen species versus the NADH that's you know oxidized only in the complex one and generates more reactive oxygen species. So the, for the people who want to geek out on that stuff, you can look into that. I am not going to cover this in any detail, but I did mention it a little earlier. Uh, peroxisome proliferator activator receptor and adiponectin. So that's for people who want to geek out a little bit on that stuff. So, but, question. I have a question about like, the, uh, the reactive oxygen species. Um, I read some quotes that say it cannot, if it's outside the cell, it cannot go into the cell because there's in the membrane there's some like um, molecules that protect the inner side of the cell for these like outsiders. So the reactive oxygen species that are created by the mitochondria are inside the cell. So, so they are doing damage. Now, if there are reactive oxygen species that are outside the cell, maybe they can't penetrate. They can still damage the cell membrane. So you know, whether the uh, reactive oxygen species is within the cell or outside the cell, it can still damage the cell. So at the end of the day, right, with, uh, with chronic long-term consumption of excess carbohydrate, especially fructose, that induces a lot of the aspects of metabolic syndrome, leptin resistance, insulin resistance, inflammation, high fasting blood glucose levels, high fasting insulin, increased adiposity, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, dyslipidemia, hypertension, advanced glycation end products, and type 2 diabetes. Can I get some? Right? Eat those healthy carbohydrates at 60%, even if you're fat, overweight, and you're not doing any exercise, it's good for you. I don't know where they're getting that information from, but it's not what I would recommend. And if that list is not impressive enough, there's more. So this is a, a paper by Lauren Cordain, hyperinsulinemic diseases of civilization more than just syndrome X. It turns out that the endocrine shifts that occurs once you have hyperinsulinemia uh, encourages the, the, the cellular proliferation and growth in a variety of tissues, the clinical course of which may promote acne, early menarche, certain epithelial cell carcinomas, increased stature, myopia, cutaneous papillomas, uh, acanthosis nigricans, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and male vertex balding. That's pat male pattern balding. Excellent. I could keep going all day. Insulin sensitiv sensitivity is a key mediator of growth hormone action and longevity. Now, here's another thing. If your insulin sensitivity is completely screwed up, longevity suffers. Transient high glucose causes persistent epigenetic changes and altered gene expression during subsequent normal glycemia. This is what I was talking about earlier in response to a question about how these spikes in sugars can change your genetic expression and flip these switches uh, and that won't get turned off until you go you know, zero or low carb and then back up again. So more information on that. Uh, one thing that I'd really recommend as homework, not all of the information in the talk is accurate, uh, but you go to YouTube and you type sugar, the bitter truth, and there's a, a pretty decent talk by Robert Lustig of uh, UCSF that's given there. Um, it is entirely based on overconsumption of fructose, and there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, you know, under certain conditions, fructose is, is good. And like, yeah, I covered that. But it turns out, and the reality is, that most of us eat too much, and most of us eat too much carbohydrates. So a lot of what we've dis that, that we talked about here is very relevant and applicable to the real world. What uh, Robert Lustig likes to do is compare fructose to ethanol because both substrates can only be dealt with by the liver. And he puts up these, he puts up these two slides. He looks at acute ethanol exposure and acute fructose exposure. Remember, acute is one large dose, you know, one single time. And fructose doesn't do a whole lot because the brain doesn't process fructose. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. But, you know, ethanol causes CNS depression, vasodilation, hypothermia, myocardial depression, variable pupillary responses, respiratory depression, diuresis, hypoglycemia, and loss of fine motor control. In other words, you're drunk, you know, and it messes you up. And here are the chronic ethanol exposure symptoms. Hemat hematologic disorders, electrolyte abnormalities, hypertension, cardiac dilation, cardiomyopathy, dyslipidemia, pancreatitis, malnutrition, obesity, hepatic dysfunction, alcoholic steatohepatitis, fetal alcohol syndrome, and addiction. And then you look at chronic fructose overexposure, hypertension, 
myocardial infarction, dyslipidemia, pancreatitis, obesity, hepatic dysfunction, which is non-alcoholic, steatohepatitis in this case, fetal insulin resistance, and habituation, if not addiction. Lustig likes to say fructose is ethanol without the buzz. Right? You go outside and you look around and you see a bunch of overweight people and it's like a bunch of alcoholics. They're fructoseaholics. And their metabolism is, metabolism is completely screwed up for a very similar reason. So when people bring up the comments about relatively high carbohydrate consumption, is it really the fructose which is the deal? So a lot, of pre, a lot of people like to bring up the ketovans, and they're like, well, you know, if carbohydrate is so bad, why are these people OK? And if you look at what they're eating, it's mostly glucose with like a little bit of fructose. I mean, there is some fruit in there, watermelon and whatnot, but it's a lot of tubers. It's a lot of starch. So they're fine. Yeah. So they're fine. So they're, they're, it's not a paradigm. You know, and that's what I recommend to endurance athletes. You need to, you know, supplement your diet with about 60% carbohydrate because you're doing all this endurance stuff. Stick to glucose such that you avoid metabolic syndrome. And, you know, you're going to replenish all of the muscle glycogen first with a little bit of, of replenishment of the liver glycogen. And then it kind of get into this, well, how much fructose should I be having? Gee, you know, it depends on how much activity you have. And I would say, well, okay, the, the muscles can store about 1,600 calories as, as glycogen, whereas the, 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 the liver is about 400. So maybe you should have like a 4 to 1 ratio. But I'm not 100% sure. But I would still keep the glucose higher than the fructose. Is there a question online? Okay. Uh, the results of chronic excess CHO are obviously proven based on the research proven. So why is it the FDA and most every registered dietitian you come across promote high CHO and low yeah, protein diets? Yeah, love that question, right? It's, if you talk to a researcher um, that is in this field, it is undeniable that chronic overexposure undeniable. Like anybody who denies that is a lunatic because they'll get lambasted. The, the literature, just everybody agrees on that. So why do the dietitians still recommend a diet that's about 60% carbohydrate, most of which coming from heart healthy whole grains? And the reason why is because they painted themselves into a corner. They think fat is bad, so you shouldn't be eating that. And they also think that protein is bad because they think it's bad for the kidneys, which turns out is a myth. The kidneys will adapt to the, the protein. A lot of people who have uh, kidney problems, turns out that you'll find protein in the urine. But then, you know, this linear logic tells you, oh, then the, the protein must be bad for the kidneys. No. It's like there's some damage that was done, and then protein winds up in the urine, but it doesn't mean that the protein is the problem. And it's been shown that protein... Uh, that the kidneys do adapt to higher protein diets. There is a physiological limit to how much protein you can process, which is true, and there is something called protein toxicity, also called uh, rabbit starvation. So when you get to 35 40% of calories per protein, if you go like a little bit above that, you start to get diarrhea, and then if you go further and further, you can get into problems, and ultimately, if all you have to eat is like really low-fat protein, you will die. You know, and that's true, but protein is not bad. So they painted themselves into a corner. Fat is bad, protein is bad, what left? Carbohydrate. So they keep recommending carbohydrate. A lot of people argue, saying, oh no, I'm not addicted to sugar, I can quit that any time, I'm fine. And uh, yeah, there is such a thing as sugar addiction, and, then, and it's being studied. There's a, this is one paper in many. So then uh, here's the question, right? Now, how much fructose is too much? If you read certain papers, people will tell you, yeah, well, you know, before, before we had access to all of this sugar and stuff, natural consumption of fruits will give you about 15 to 20 grams. But then I'm like, well, it depends how much fruit. You know, I mean, if, if I eat fruit all day, I'll get a lot more than that. Uh, and then there's other uh, publications that tell you that about 100 grams a day is problematic. We'll get to that shortly. But my take on it is, like, how active are you? Like, do you need liver glycogen replenishment? Are you doing a lot of high intensity activity? And if the, if the answer is yes, then you can tolerate a little bit more than the average individual. If you're like a, you know, training for a triathlon or something like that, like you're doing a lot of, of that kind of work, 
you might be able to tolerate up to 50 grams, not something I would recommend. I actually, I prefer these levels uh, better, but it all depends on your activity level, you know, and how much liver glycogen you need. But ideally, there's, you know, like I said, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. And if you, you know, if you eat glucose, you will eventually replenish some liver glycogen too, as well as some muscle glycogen without the negative effects that are associated with that. Now, it turns out that if you're completely unactive and you eat a ton of glu glucose all the time, your muscle glycogen is going to fill up and more and more sugar is going to eat the, hit the liver. Eventually, it will become a problem. But glucose is a lot less likely to be problematic as fructose because your body gets a pass at it before your liver does. Right, so the brain, the muscles, and all the organs, the heart, all these things get to burn some of it before it hits the liver. So the, the dose is, a lot, is much lower. Do we have a question online? Yeah, back to protein. Do you yeah. have any comment on the China study? Oh, hmm. I'm trying not to curse because we're online uh, and the media is here. <sighs> Let me take some water. It's tea. You know, I was saying earlier, you got like researchers like David Jenkins and, and T. Colin Campbell and, the, and, and their ilk that, uh, and Ornish that are obviously biased and do biased research, and this is one of them. So first and foremost, the China study is an epidemiological study. It is association, it is correlation, it is not causation, right? And I would highly recommend, so I have what I'm, I'm not going to cover today, but I have uh, a slideshow that I send with additional information, one of which is like I highly recommend a book called The Vegetarian Myth. The other one is a bunch of critiques that have been done on the, uh, on the China study that show that the, the data it was cherry-picked. One of my biggest beefs with it uh, is the fact that if you look at some of... Uh, of T. Colin Campbell's research, like the, the, the one that's animal model based, not epidemiological based, he has, a, I think it's, it's, it's a rat study, and he's feeding the rats either soy protein or casein. Casein is one of the most problematic protein fractions in dairy. So there, he's feeding them either casein and soy protein, and he notices that the rats that are fed casein get more cancer than the ones that are fed soy protein. From that one study makes the leap that all protein must be bad. And you look at that and like, okay, obviously this guy is biased and is using this flawed study to further his goals. What he doesn't tell you is that there's plenty of studies out there where they feed rats whey protein and that is actually protective against cancer. So it's, a, I mean, it's a huge hoax. I think there's a better way to be a vegan or a vegetarian, but if you really believe that this is better for your health or better for the planet, you are highly mistaken. Highly mistaken. And there's plenty of vegetarians, especially the ones that do the, the low fat thing, that have huge problems with bone mineral density. Uh, and you'll find this, I mean, first of all, you'll see them, they're, they're fairly pasty looking. They're very, very thin because they're not eating enough protein and not the right amount of protein, so they have, um, they, they have very low muscle mass. Those that don't have really low muscle mass or, or those that remain obese is because there's too much carbohydrate in the diet. Um, and, and you'll see like they, their backs round a little bit. This happens mostly in women. Uh, and Lear Keith had a problem with that. Uh, it's a bone mineral density in the spine and whatnot. Uh, so, so it's a, I mean, it's a huge concern. As I was on the bus on my way here, um, I'm sitting on the bus, and there's this girl that walks in, and she's like rail thin, and she's got like this rounded back. And, you know, I'm looking at it, I'm like, yeah, here's an observational study. Let's see if I can confirm it. So I, I, I you know, I start a conversation. I say, hey, uh, are you a vegetarian or a vegan? She's like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah. I could tell from a mile away. You know, it's just, it, it is not healthy. But if you want to do it and be a little healthier, I would say, you know, get a lot of coconut, 
olives and avocados in your diet, increase the fat. When you're having veggies, have them with fat to extract more fat-soluble vitamins from your diet. All things like A, D, E, and K, like really freaking important. And then I'll, I'll get to a little bit more of that later. Like if you are going to have grains and legumes, you know, try to put them on fermented things. Try to avoid over the, the grains and legumes things because you're, you're going to get some problems with that. Uh, and then the whole sustainability thing, hey, listen, grain agriculture was discovered in this part, or was started in this part called the Fertile Crescent. This is where Iran and Iraq now sit. It used to be called the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is now a desert. And it is a desert because of grain agriculture. Last month, we had a gig in Penetanguishene. As we were driving from Toronto to Penetanguishene, we passed a bunch of, uh, of cornfields. And you look at the cornfields and you look at the color of the soil and it's the color of sand. And it is literally turning into sand. But then you pass the marshes, right, where they grow all the vegetables. What color is the soil in the marshes? Black, right? It's black. Grain agriculture is not sustainable. And any plant biologist will tell you this because annuals, as opposed to perennials, deplete the soil. A lot, and soy is not enough to replete the soil. So it, it's simply not sustainable, not on the scale that we're doing it in. Whereas grass farming, you know, take animals, put them on pasture, eat the animals, that is sustainable. So if you really think that you're, you know, you're healthier and, and that the planet's going to be better off because you're a vegetarian, you are highly mistaken, and I highly, educa I highly recommend that you educate yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question, right? So people who are vegetarians, they insist on eating grains. Should they eat white bread versus whole grains? I'll tell you neither. Like they should actually eat, if you're going to eat bread, you should eat sourdough bread, real sourdough bread. Like if you go to Whole Foods and you try to get sourdough bread, pick it up, look at the label, and it, it's not even clear that they actually fermented the dough to it. It kind of defeats the purpose, and you'll see why a little bit later. Um, but if you really do have a choice between white or white, the white, it has less crap. It literally does, and, and we'll see see that a little bit later. Yeah, that's right. So there's a huge issue of uh, mineral loss due to anti-nutrients in the grain, and so we're going to talk about that uh, in the next slideshow which is a huge problem when it comes to eating a lot of unfermented, you know, quote-unquote, heart-healthy whole grains. This is, that's another thing that comes as one word. Saturated, uh, artery-clogging saturated fat is one of them. Heart-healthy whole grains is another one. And that claim is based on the fact that heart-healthy whole grains lower cholesterol levels. But I just showed you that cholesterol is fairly irrelevant when it comes to heart disease unless you know what the, the profile is. Um, and it turns out that it lowers both LDL and HDL. Oh, like, great. That's right. So if you look at it from a historical standpoint, fructose consumption, you know, you're looking at the 1800s, you know, the, the, the levels are pretty low as far as millions of tons are concerned. And then you look at 2000, it's like, wow. You know, and of course, if you look at uh, the uh, increase in incidence of disease from 1800 to 2000, it's significant. Right, very significant. So this is just a, a, another way of looking at the, uh, the increase in fructose consumption. So about 15 grams per day from natural consumption of fruits and vegetables. Of course, it depends how much fruit and, uh, and which ones. Uh, prior to World War II, about 16 to 24 grams of fructose per day. In 1977 to 1978, 37 grams per day. 1994, 57 grams per day. 10 to 10 percent of ca uh, total caloric intake, and in adolescence in 2008, 72.8 grams per day, 12 percent of total caloric intake, and 25 percent of adolescents consumed at least 15 percent of total calories from fructose. Something that you know historically has never been seen before. So might this be problematic? Yeah, I mean, given the science that we just covered, yeah, yeah, that is a huge problem, right? So now. You know, here's something that's really frustrating when it comes to nutrition research is that sometimes companies are going to get into the way. 
So, and they're going to confuse the matter, and that's to their advantage. So you look at fructose consumption and consequences for glycation, blah, 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 and they're trying to determine, you know, how much fructose can you eat per day? Remember, I just told you less than 100 grams per day is really problematic. Um, so you look at this, and they're like, yeah, we think that about greater or equal to 90 grams per day is beneficial. It has a beneficial effect on HbA1c. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so we recommend that even, you know, greater than 50, 50 grams can be tolerated. And you read this, and like, Really? You know, what the heck's going on? What's the problem? And then you get into the details and you realize that the research was supported by Danisco, which is a producer of fructose. I'm like, yeah, great. That sounds like, that sounds like a fairly fair estimate of how much fructose I should be eating every day. Right? So, like I said, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Glucose is a far less problematic than fructose. Just lay off. You know, lay off of this stuff. Diet. I thought I'd taken that out. Not sure why it's still in there. Diabetes from fruit. The, um, Dr. Davis runs this uh, blog called the Hard Scan blog. Totally legit. Really like his stuff. And he deals with, uh, this is a real doctor, deals with real patients. And he tells this, this person, you know, okay, here's how I want you to eat. The person misinterprets it and thinks that he needs to eat a whole lot of fruit. So the guy starts to, heat, uh, to eat a crap load of fruit and his blood sugars you know, rise to dangerously high levels, the diabetic levels. And he does this just by eating fruit at every meal. Then let's look at the fruits. You know, if I'm going to eat some fruit, which ones have more fructose, which one has less? Well, limes and lemons, not too surprisingly, don't have a whole lot of fructose. And then as you go down the list, you're going to find that the fructose increases. Still, even things like grapefruit and, and, and blackberries are not that high. Uh, berries tend to be, you know, a pretty good place to, to be as far as fruit's concerned. But then when you get to, of course, dried fruits, uh, that's, uh, the fructose content is pretty high. Mangoes is fairly high. Raisins, pears, apples, uh, bananas, etc. So am I telling you you should never, never, never eat a mango? No. Am I telling you you shouldn't eat mangoes all day long? Yeah. You know, yeah. So, I mean, when I give the, the, the dietary recommendations at the end of the talk, limiting fruit intake is going to be one of them. And the amount of fruit that you should be having in your diet will depend on your physical activity. There are hereditary, hereditary fructose intolerances. You might notice clients of yours, you know, that if they keep the fructose in their diet, they're going to have a hard time losing weight. And that's just because they are genetically intolerant to the stuff. And the, this is very well known. A question that comes up often is there a difference between high fructose corn syrup and table sugar? And the first time this was asked to me, I mean, you know, I'm a chemist. I'm like, well, high fructose for corn syrup is like 45% glucose, 55% fructose, depending on the brand. There's, there's various grades. And then sugar is 50-50. So I'm like, there can't be that much of a difference. But the bond between the glycosides in high fructose corn syrup is already ruptured. So it's, it's the monosaccharides, the pure monosaccharides, whereas in sugar, it's intact. So your body does have, like sucrase in the gut, does have to work a little bit to break the bond that's in the sugar, in the table sugar, whereas in fructose, it's already, in high fructose corn syrup, it's already done for you. High fructose corn syrup is like pre-digested sugar. And these researchers fed high fructose corn syrup and sugar to mice and, and rodents, and they found that, you know, indeed, the high fructose corn syrup was worse. They were both bad. Uh, they both increased weight gain, uh, but the uh, high fructose corn syrup was uh, much worse than, or not much worse, was a little bit worse than the sugar. So there is a difference. And then here's, you know, consuming fructose sweetened beverages as opposed to glucose sweetened beverages increases visceral adiposity and lipids and decreases insulin sensitivity. And this is the whole theory I'm saying, you know, it, it's a lot more difficult to create problems with glucose overconsumption than it is with fructose overconsumption. And this study shows specifically that. So then we get to diet. Should I be on a high carb diet? Should I be on a low carb diet? And what's interesting to me, I mean, the, the low carb diets definitely work. Um, and it work because we covered for some people the metabolic uh, state is completely screwed up. Some people no longer have the, the capacity to produce enough insulin to deal with the carbohydrate. 
But what I think is going on with the, the low carbohydrate diet is that they instinctively, those things eliminate a lot of problematic foods from the diet. That'll become increasingly clear when we cover uh, some of the, uh, the, the grains and, and the problems with grains and legumes uh, that's coming up. So these things eliminate a lot of uh, problematic foods from the diet. And like I said, it, you know, there's, this, there's these ketobins that eat a lot of glucose. The ketobins are at 69% of calories from carbohydrate, 21% fat, and 10% protein. Uh, there are uh, modern hunter-gatherers that live in Catawba. It's an island off of Papua New Guinea, and they have virtually none of the diseases of, mo of modern civilization, even though their carbohydrate uh, intake is high. And like I said, it's because it's mostly fructose with a little bit of glucose. So I think that that's what these low-carbohydrate diets, uh, for the most part, uh, work because, yeah, I mean, they're, they're eliminating a lot of the fructose, uh, but they're also eliminating a lot of problematic foods. In any event, so here's a two groups of people, one of them is put on a low carbohydrate diet and the other one is put on a weight loss drug plus a low fat diet. And if you read the details, it turns out that the low carbohydrate diet is ad libitum. They can eat as much as they want. Whereas these guys, I think, have a restriction of, yeah, an energy deficit of 5,000 to 1,000, 500 to 1,000 calories. And at the end of the day, the low carb group has better lab numbers, right? So here's this group, this is like the super group, right? The most dietitians would be like, oh wow, like here's, here's the low fat with the, with the diet loss drug and calorically restricted, these guys have to win and they don't. So that says a lot about these low fat diets. Uh, here is the effect of high protein ketogenic diet on hunger, appetite, and weight loss in obese men feeding ad libitum. In the short term, high protein, low carbohydrate ketogenic diets reduce hunger and lower food intake significantly and more than do high protein, medium carbohydrate, non ketogenic diets. This is a really interesting trial that compared the Atkins, the Zone, and the Ornish diets, in the, which you know, increase the carbohydrate as you go, and the, and the Learn diets. And they found that the folks that were on Atkins had better lab numbers and lost more weight. Now, what you need to know is that. The, the way the trial worked is that the, the folks came in, they had a dietitian that gave them the book, here's the book for this diet, here's how you apply it, and then they were sent home to do whatever they want, but they still recorded some of the, the numbers and the food intake, and it turns out that the people you know, kind of started Atkins-ish, but slowly increased their, their carbohydrates such that they, they, they got to zone levels at the end, and then the zone people got a little higher and, and whatnot. But the ones that were limiting their carbohydrate, got better lab numbers, and lost more weight. You know, so that's, there's no doubt that. Weight loss with a low carbohydrate, Mediterranean or low fat diet, and of course the low carbohydrate diet, again, takes the cake. All right. So when it comes to low carb versus high carb, you're going to hear this thing called the metabolic advantage. A lot of people argue about this. From a biochemistry standpoint, it seems very likely that this thing exists. And it exists because if you're on a low carbohydrate diet, your body has to work to take protein and turn it into sugar. Gluconeogenesis, and that's fat fueled. So if you have two groups, one's on a low carbohydrate diet, one's on a high carbohydrate diet, and both of them are at the same caloric level, the low carb people are gonna lose more weight because they're burning more calories. They have to work harder to create the sugar that they need, right? So this thing is called the, the metabolic advantage and that your metabolism is a little higher when you're on a low carbohydrate diet as opposed to a high carbohydrate diet, which makes sense because a high carbohydrate diet is like taking a shortcut, right? Oh, you need sugar? Here it is, right here. You don't need to work for it. I'm giving it to you. Uh, ketogenic diets and kidney stones. This is something that, might, that you might see. The problem with that is that a lot of people that go ketogenic don't pay attention to the food quality and they use a heck of a lot of dairy products in their diets. That gives them too much calcium, which then leads to kidney stones. So it's not the ketogenic diet that leads to the kidney stones, it's the excess calcium that they're putting in there that leads to kidney stones. So that's a misunderstanding. And I love this one because there was a whole cholesterol egg controversy not too long ago. 
Dietary cholesterol from eggs increases plasma HDL cholesterol in overweight men consuming a carbohydrate-restricted diet. You know, that's just like a touche for the, the, the people that are still uh, obsessed with, uh, with cholesterol. And then finally, ketogenic diets and insulin sensitivity. So we've talked about insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance within the context of carbohydrate overconsumption. And most of the people get this feeling that insulin resistance is bad. And it turns out that it depends on the context. If you are in an accident and you start to lose a lot of blood very quickly, your body's gonna become insulin resistant. Why? Survival. To spare glucose for your brain such that you survive. So your body can turn on insulin resistance fairly rapidly. If you are on a ketogenic, like really low carbohydrate diet, you will naturally become somewhat insulin resistant. Why? In order to spare glucose for your brain, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important resource and it's rare. So you're gonna become somewhat insulin resistant. But this is very different from the insulin resistance that results from carbohydrate overconsumption in two ways. And the one, it's very highly reversible. If you start eating more carbohydrate, it'll go away. And two, it's not accompanied by the high levels of blood glucose and all of the disadvantages that, and detrimental effects that are accompanied with that. Everybody understand that? So insulin resistance isn't necessarily bad. I mean, people to know that because it's really important. So when you, and, you know, one of the things that causes that actually is palmitic acid. So if you eat a lot of meat, you eat a lot of fat, you might eat a lot of palmitic acid as opposed to generating it from carbohydrate overconsumption. And it turns out that this affects insulin secretion. So if you treat the pancreatic islets with palmitic acid, you're gonna decrease insulin secretion. And the insulin secretion is decreased, again, because you don't wanna take all the glucose that's in the bloodstream and shove it into the cells. You want it to be safe for the brain. So this, uh, this whole thing about insulin resistance being you know, bad all the time isn't necessarily true. So now you know, we're at a crossroads. Is it the carbohydrate, is it the fat? And you know, I hope that I've convinced you that it can be either or. There are bad fats, there are bad carbohydrates. Linoleic acid in excess will be problematic. Fructose in excess is gonna be problematic. But you now see that there's a good way to do high carb and there's a bad way. There's a good way to do high fat and there's a bad way. So here's Ronald Cross, again, this lipid researcher, saturated fat, carbohydrate, and cardiovascular disease. And you can read all of this, uh, it, really interesting, but what I like at the end is that, particularly given the differential effects of dietary saturated fats and carbohydrates on concentrations of larger and smaller LDL particles, respectively, dietary efforts to improve the increasing burden in cardiovascular disease risk associated with atherogenic dyslipidemia should primarily emphasize the limitation of refined carbohydrate intake and a reduction in excess adiposity. You know, so he's like, all right, this is, this is it. You know, we've had enough. You should probably admit this, this carbohydrate intake. We have enough evidence. This is what's causing all of these problems. With that, I think that we are done with the carbohydrate hypothesis. Should we start the, where's Donnie? Hey, Danny. Start the next section, or do you think we should take a small break at this point? What do people think? Yeah, I should take a break and take a for the camera. Okay.